Akarda, Lokdeshta, Devro Mahasa is a Tahid Balta Rog Stakanov. Uh, is play a Tah or Shulgun uh, inov. Play if we star the Goyling at the start in to her. Agasta on session shot or agru we go for did our Conan Goyle, the Klingon Center for Contemporary Ireland, Agas the Keogh Norton Institute for Irish Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Agas in Hunter inov. Uh, Gormila Mahat, Avrian, Augusta An, or Hester Conan Agrega, on Imachcha, Arachta, Le Gofart, Le Oskol, Notre Dame. Um, and we're delighted to be hosting this event in cooperation with the University of Notre Dame. Uh, Brian and I have uh, cooperated on many projects over the years, and I'm looking forward to collaborating with him on many in the future, and also with some of the other people who will be with us uh, this evening. We're hosting this event in English because it's designed for an international audience. On Regis Nostalgia Aim to Hear, the Irish language in the United States. And we're hoping that uh, this kind of quick run through some of the latest research in this area will give people an insight into some of the work that's going on and maybe sell a few books as well while we're at it. Um, we're going to start off this evening with Una Nivermail who lectures in American history at Mary Immaculate College in the University of Limerick. She's the author of the foundational book, Building Irish Identity in America, 1870 to 1915, The Gaelic Revival, that was published by Four Courts Press in 2003. And she's currently researching the life, work and influence of the New York Irish American lawyer and influence broker, John Quinn. He served as the patron to literary figures and artists such as W.B. Yeats, James Joyce, T.S. Eliot, Augustus, John, Marcel, Duchamp and Picasso. And of course, he also was a great facilitator of Douglas Hyde's tour to the United States in 1905-1906. Following that, uh, folks, following that, my apologies, we go next to um, Hollis, J. Hollis Harris, who is a doctoral candidate in the Department of History at Northern Illinois University, DeKalb, Illinois. Uh, Hollis is a second year PhD student uh, at that university in Northern Illinois, where he earned an MA uh, as well as BAs in history and religious studies from the University of North Carolina, Willingham. He studies nationalist political culture in early 20th century Irish America, with a particular focus on Clamagale's 1899 reunification efforts, uh, which is the subject of his doctoral dissertation. And then after Jay Hollis, we'll be hearing from Tim McMahon, who is Associate Professor of History at Marquette University. A former president of the American Conference for Irish Studies, is the author of Grand Opportunity, the Gaelic Revival and Irish Society, 1893 to 1910. The editor of the memoir, Parik O'Fahy's War of Independence, Recollections of a Galway Gaelic Leaguer. And at present, he's writing a monograph that interrogates the impact of partition on identities across Ulster, and the rest of Ireland. August and Head Frank Torella, not Fiona Lines, and Dr. Fiona Lines, uh, who teaches at the School of Irish, Celtic Studies and Folklore, University College Dublin, as well as being an Irish language tutor in Fionter of Iskol Magelga in Dublin City University. Her doctoral dissertation was entitled How Loves of Us. Irish language revival media and the transatlantic influence of 1857 to 1897. And this dissertation focused on the role of media and cultural organizations in the Irish language revival movement on a transatlantic basis. She was the research assistant on the European Research Council funded research project, Youth Engagement in European Language Preservation, uh, 1900 to 2020, which focuses on the Irish, Welsh and Catalan languages. And last but not least, and somebody who will be joining us later on this evening and who will be speaking at the end is Nick Wolf, who is the Associate Director of Research and Publication Initiatives at NYU, the editor of ERA Ireland and the author of the groundbreaking and award-winning monograph, An Irish-Speaking Island, State, Religion, Community, and the Linguistic Landscape in Ireland, 1770 to 1870. So uh, we'll start off uh, our conversations, our introductions this evening with Una, uh, Una Nivramail. Um, Irish-American newspapers, what makes them such an interesting source for your research? 
Um, well, there were there were a number of reasons, I think, that I went to Irish American newspapers to start off with. I had been working a lot with um, with uh, sets of papers here, as in, you know, people's personal papers, Douglas Hyde and uh, other letters and various things like that. But Irish American newspapers were this incredible repository of activities and um, of what the Gaelic societies were doing when they were founded, um, who was in them, um, the links between people who were actually in the Gaelic societies and other societies as well. Um, sometimes you had minutes of meetings, you had motions, particularly ones that were defeated um, because there, there was a row about them and they were reported in the Irish American press. Um, you had things like ads for books, you had ads for concerts, Concerts. Uh, you had reports on concerts, you had ads for picnics and balls, where they were held, how many people turned up, how many people were turned away. Um, so there was a whole series of different kinds of things in the Irish American newspapers. You also had really important information, like, for example, um, how much it cost to join a society, how much a concert cost. So you could maybe see the kinds of people who were actually going to be attending, um, where they were held, uh, Jones's Wood, Carnegie Hall, um, various other places um, around the United States, not obviously just in New York. And the Irish American newspapers were um, useful, not just for me, obviously, but at the time, they were really useful um, conduits of information for uh, Irish Americans who wanted to actually join a Gaelic society. So they would have lessons in them, um, small phrases that you could use. Here's something that was going to be helpful to you when you show up on the night. Um, they had stories um, that you could read. They had excerpts, so uh, serials of things that you could listen, you know, read uh, week in, week out. Um, and of course, you had letters uh, from people who were attending or who were refusing to attend, um, or uh, you had letters from people trying to set up societies. And definitely you had a lot of editorials um, and, of course, exhortations also. Please come. Um, this is your future. This is your culture. This is your Ireland. Um, so you had lots of those kinds of things that you were getting attitudes. You were getting um I suppose, uh, a sense of the contemporary way that Irish Americans felt about their culture and heritage, whether it was real, whether it was about the language or what it was about, really. Um, and that's why I found them so interesting. And you also mentioned in, uh, in our correspondence prior to the seminar, the conflict between the Irish language and the pleasant hour. And mm -hmm. what was that and what did it ultimately mean for the Gaelic societies? Well, a lot of the Gaelic societies uh, were focusing, they, they began uh, to bring back the language, the language of our forefathers and, you know, something that would be part of a free Ireland. But the reality of it was, of course, that, that America was English speaking and that Irish wasn't going to be much use to people if they were actually going to make it in the United States. So normally the meeting time could be from seven to nine at night or even, um, you know, from, from uh, eight to 10 at night and it would be divided into two hours so the first hour would be the language the speaking the stories uh, the grammar all of the things that really turn us on about language you know that stuff that you know that you think is so not important and the second would be given over to the pleasant hour so these would be recitations uh, songs dances um, and these were the things that really caught the imagination, I think, of a lot of the people who went to these particular Philo-Celtic or Gaelic societies, because not only was it something that was enjoyable, it was new, the dances were new, the songs um, sometimes were American songs that were translated into Irish, uh, sometimes they were old Irish songs, sometimes they were songs, in fact, that weren't Irish at all, but were, you know, were kind of uh, popular songs um, in, in English, which the Irish were using to singing but the dancing was something that was really new and that was something that really took off and and there's a couple of things that you see uh in the reports on these particular 
a pleasant hour. Um, in fact, the the uh, in 1907, I think it was, and Clive Sullish actually pointed out, or 1908, said that the hard part, and I'm not sure that this wasn't also the case in Ireland, Tim will be able to talk about that maybe, that they said that picking out the battered fragments of the language from under the heels of the dancers uh, was something that was difficult. Um, and Michal O'Lohoin, of course, who would have been, who was the person who first put forward a um, uh, a bilingual newspaper in New York. Um, he actually said, and he 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 was very cross and said there would be a fine for people who were who wasn't who those people who weren't speaking the language because he said picnics or balls should not be the object of philokels, but the cultivation of language. So this sense, I think, of the enjoyment or the socialization aspect of these particular societies that there was a conflict between the two, and this came, I suppose, more to a head um, maybe uh, under Daniel Kohalan, where he pointed out uh, in the early 20th century, you know, the language should be revived, particularly in Ireland, but that what we need here in the United States is um, a group of people who are in favour of a free Ireland. And if that meant, you know, dancing or singing or recitations, maybe then that's the way to go. Whereas the, the Irish language part could be given over to those at home uh, in this particular instance. So I think there was a lot of conflict between those two. And I mean, some of the things that we see coming out of that, obviously two probably of the biggest um, stars in Irish dancing, um, Michael Flatley and Jean Butler in Riverdance, both of them are, are American, you know, they were American to start off with. And, and even if you take, and, and I, I hesitate to talk about scandals in Irish dance, but um, you know the focus at the moment on the Commission Larinke Gaelacha. It is so transnational and transatlantic. Everywhere there are judges that are problematic. Um, so from that point of view, you can see the push I think from the Gaelic societies into uh, dancing and singing away in many ways from the language, and that's the conflict between that pleasant hour um, and the language itself. There are even echoes of that in the contemporary. Um, question of Iraqtas Nagwega, which is primarily an Irish language festival, and with the increase in popularity of Shano's dancing, there's been a feeling that those competitions are more associated with your speakers attending the festival. And so there's been a lot of talk about how to how to deal with that and how to uh, to preserve the character of the festival as an Irish language festival, um, and at, uh, at the same time keep the the dancing part of it uh, as vigorous as possible. So it's an interesting contemporary residence for, for what you're referencing there. I think, Brian, you had a question. I was just, I mean, there's an argument that in one sense, the creation and codification of Irish dance, the fashion as we now know them, may be, if not the Conra's greatest achievement, certainly one of its major uh, contributions to contemporary Irish culture. I, I was wondering if Una could just very, very quickly uh, break down for us what the organisations were. So we're all familiar with Cunan Gaelic the Gaelic League, but what were the other types of organisations which were active in America in the late 19th, early 20th century? Um, Conor Nguega was relatively late in, in many ways in comparison to the Philo-Celtic societies that we're actually looking at uh, in the context of the United States. I suppose the very first one um, is 1872 and it's Michael J. Logan uh, in Brooklyn um, where he actually starts up this Philo-Celtic society. You have one in Boston after that and these are Philo-Celtic societies, the focus really on the idea of folklore, the idea of a Celtic past, which is a positive Celtic past, not something that's denigrated. And then you have Gaelic societies, which of course are coming not just from Ireland, but also from the basis of these Philo-Celtic societies, where I think Michael J. Logan says, you know, even the few scattered natives of Bohemia have their own newspaper. Um, and, and, and in the United States, what you're looking at, I suppose, particularly with the Irish, where they are um, located in the various wards, in the various cities, they're actually living cheek by jowl with people who are speaking different languages, who have different cultures, um, who are going ahead, particularly even with the Germans, uh, who were their contemporaries in terms of migration to the United States, even as far back as the 1850s. The Germans have their own language schools, they have their own language 
language in their schools. Um, and the Irish, for example, the, the focus tends to be on Catholicism rather than on the language. But the Irish are pushing from the 1870s and the 1880s for the recognition of this culture, for the recognition of their language. And so when Conor na Gaeilge, um begins in Dublin, um, you actually have this push across the Atlantic for the imprimatur almost of what the Gaelic societies already had going in the United States. Um, and so that connection between them is not necessarily coming one way across the Atlantic. It is transatlantic, maybe something what Fiona will talk about um, in terms of, of, of these particular societies and the way that they are linked together. And just to finish up, there's it's it's a pity we have such limited time actually because there are so many avenues opening up there, but uh, because we have to move on with our time and for the general audience, uh, what are the other main sources you use for your work? And are there any sources that you would love to get access to but you haven't been able to access until now or haven't been able to exploit until now for one reason or another? Oh, God, I mean, they, there are so many sources that I would have loved to have gotten access to, but they may be in people's attics, you know, um, the notion that people actually kept records um, of some of these societies and that they are locked away somewhere in a box. Um, or the arguments that people had with each other, because as always in Irish societies, you know, the very first item on the agenda, the split, um, the idea that there were so many different personalities in particular, and societies didn't necessarily agree with each other. Um, they would split off into different groups. Some wanted to sing, um, and this was a huge problem. Some wanted, in fact, to have um, only Irish. This, this came, I think, more to a head um, with, for example, Douglas Hyde, when he shows up, and 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 you're very familiar with this, Kuan, and the whole notion of who would meet him, uh, what kind of people would actually be invited to the various things. What should he talk about? Let not the meeting be too dry. Will it all be in English? Um, John Quinn, who I'm working on at the moment, <laughs> said to Douglas Hyde, you know, they wanted you met. This is Major McChrystal and Dermot Lynch. They wanted you met at the at the 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 um at the key with a band, probably a German band, and this I had to kill. So I think that these kinds of ideas would be very good. Looking at people's papers, obviously, um, was fascinating. Um, John Quinn's papers in particular. Uh, there are some, obviously, in Dublin, but there's a huge amount in the New York Public Library, and he continues to be a fascination for me. But the, the one thing that I found was hard to get was actual uh, minutes and records of the Gaelic societies themselves. Um, I found that very difficult, which is why I relied so much on the newspapers. Um, and in fact, of course, as always, when you finish something, you discover that there were things lurking in people's um, attics or lurking in, in collections that you hadn't known about. And, um, and when you move on, you sort of move on rather than actually going back to them. So maybe I'm leaving it to lots of other fabulous new scholars um, to do that. You can see the old hair has gone a bit grey. So so uh, maybe, you know, it's the new scholars who need to look more towards that. <laughs> well, we'll be we'll be asking this question, actually, of everybody. And if we find that there's something very strongly in common, then we'll be able to um, put together some kind of a petition or some kind of a <laughs> vote for somebody. I think um, it's time for us to move on to our next guest. Uh, and I think I'll hand over to Brian at this point. OK, so our next speaker is Fiona. Fiona is going to address uh, media in the what we call the early part of the revival in North America. Yeah, so um, my thesis in particular looked from 1857 all the way up to 1897. And I suppose I we chose those two milestones in particular, um, looking at 1857, so the very first Gaelic column being published in New York, Irish American, and then 1897 as well. So when Irish is starting to be really celebrated as a literary language with the Oireachtas um, in Dublin. And really, I suppose 57 to 93 in particular looks at pre conan as well um, in Dublin. And that's what was really fascinating for me with my research was that really, as, as kind of Una has said as well previously, all the similarities really 
So I particularly looked at ideology and methodology in particular, um, but very similar to Una as well. I was looking at the Gaelic societies and just similarities in terms of, in particular, the debates and the discussions they were having um, in terms of, for example, font. Um, what should it be the Gaelic font that's published in the journalism um, or should it be the Roman font? And the ideology really behind that is, as Una was saying as well, you know, patriotism, nationalism as well. Um, what was published in the Irish language manuscripts um, years ago and that's the way we should go or should we really I suppose have the Irish language as a more modern journalistic literary language and print it in the Roman font which was seen in the different publications um, at the time and what was going to be used future but also looking at that in a teaching and learning context as well because of course Roman font is easier for new learners to learn the language as well so looking at interesting debates such as that and um, font but then of course looking at um kind of spelling orthography and um, what way kind of uh, um, very much seen in your own research brain as well um, in fantasy and Gaelga should it be phonetics should we write Irish phonetically should it be kind of based on the dialects so really looking really at the foundations I suppose true journalism in Irish America um, and what we would see later on kind of when they were really trying to I suppose, entice people to learn the language and revive it again. And in Ireland, we see the kind of the seeds and the same kind of mindset really very early on in Irish America. Um, and in terms of methodology, you know, the Gaelic societies as well, different branches. Um, and really kind of Una mentioned um, Michael Logan as well, really his ideas and what he tried to kind of put into practice in an Irish American sense that perhaps maybe didn't come to fruition and um, just kind of lack of support or perhaps lack of resources and um, geographical perhaps location as well, but really kind of his ideas that he had and we kind of see that perhaps later on in Ireland as well. In fact, actually in, in 1890, um, so he was the he was the editor of On Gale, which was the journal published in um, Brooklyn. And in order to try and get more subscribers to this journal, he decided to um, kind of use the journal as a teaching tool so that, for example, in the month of February, there would be an exercise printed in the month of March. You would get the, the answers to that exercise, but you would have to subscribe to the journal in order to get the subsequent months. But he called this kind of, I suppose, movement or organisation, he called it he called it actually a Gaelic League. So we see actually the naming of the Gaelic League on Irish American soil in 1890, which is two years previous to the Conan Aguilga in Dublin. So really, really interesting kind of transatlantic relationships coming to the front kind of in my research as such as that. So question for you, it sounds fascinating and I look forward to seeing more of it uh, in print. We tend to gravitate towards New York, Boston, mm -hmm. Philadelphia, Chicago, where there are Irish concentrations. Is there a lacuna someplace? Is there New Orleans? Is there uh, Buffalo? Is there somewhere where we should expect there to be Irish media activity where there isn't? Or is there, conversely, is there activity where what's going on there? There, there isn't an Irish concentration there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my research in particular, I looked at five geographical locations. So, of course, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, and then I went out to San Francisco as well. So I actually thought there would be a lot more Irish language material in Philadelphia. And there actually wasn't. There wasn't a Gaelic column printed in the newspapers I got to see in Philadelphia. And um, there was kind of a lot of talk in the papers in particular about what was perhaps happening um, elsewhere in some of the Philo Celtic Society and the Philadelphia Philo Celtic Society, but no Gaelic column. Um, and I am aware that I think on Gael and the Irish American from New York was available for those Irish in Philadelphia possibly um with regard that's um one of the reasoning um kind of i suppose you would see with the branches of the different societies different kind of places popping up so for example kind of places like texas and um hawaii i think there is um uh, at various reports um kind of just really random reports you would need a little bit more research to kind of really find those areas but um in terms of, I suppose, geographical location, something that really stood out to me in my research was when I was analysing the Gaelic columns in particular, there was a lot more perhaps beginner um, 
material and teaching and learning material on the east coast so Boston and New York and then once you kind of moved out a little bit more west it was a little bit more less English and just purely Irish so there was very little for example translations to the Irish language material in the Gaelic columns and um, it very much focused on kind of giving sentences in Irish with no kind of English equivalent like you would have seen on the east coast so kind of very interesting when we compare that to the Irish context you know Dublin on the east and then you kind of have more of the guilt duct on the west so um kind of interesting comparisons with relation to geographical location within I suppose um the domestic in the um in Irish America but in terms of more places I'd need a little bit more research because I kind of I suppose the Irish American if you want to find those random reports from different Gaelic societies the Irish American seems to be that kind of central hub um, for reportage um, in terms of those Gaelic societies across the US. Um, are we making a, a mistake in dividing the US from Canada in our conversations? Do, in terms of the Irish language, is there a split between those who come first generation newly arrived immigrants who land on the east coast of North America? Is there a split between the Canadians and the the US. Yeah, um, I haven't looked into the um, in Irish um, Canada myself personally, so I, I wouldn't be an expert. I'd probably say something wrong with regards to that. But in terms of, I suppose, first immigration and maybe second immigration, you can definitely see it in the correspondence in Irish American media that the first generation are very much worried for the second generation, that they are, they're not attending the Gaelic society classes like the first generation where there wasn't as much um, kind of interest anymore in Irish language and that's really where the patriotism and kind of nationalistic ideology really comes to the fore in Irish American journalism to really try and entice them back to the language very similar to what you would see in the Irish context as well and um, so there is that worry that with generations kind of the language is lost and they very much compare it as Una mentioned as well to the German and to the Polish language and how they speak their mother tongue to their children why can't we do the same um, with the Irish language I suppose a debate that's still going going on in contemporary terms as well. To what extent did digitization of newspapers make your project feasible or I don't want to say the word easier but gave, yeah. made, made it more accessible? Yeah, 100%, and particularly so um, for the last maybe year and a half to two years of my PhD, it was actually COVID. <laughs> so that was crucial. So I was lucky I kind of fronted, I suppose, um, my my primary research, but yeah, massively. And I do have to give a shout out to Matt Unite for, um, over in um, Florida because he digitized quite a lot of material for me and we were able to create like kind of like a shared Google Drive. So anything I had from Ireland, from the NLI, in Dublin I could upload for him and he could likewise upload from his contacts in different archives across the US so I think with regards to digitization not only was that made my life a lot easier but also that cross collaboration between scholars that you kind of meet at different conferences as well you never you never really know how useful um, meeting someone randomly at a conference can be but um yeah massively digitization of sources because um I think it was only really the printed sources that I got to see in Boston, really, um, Irish Echo and Dunahoo's magazine, really. Um, and I suppose it's very different to see the feel and exactly how something was laid out to the digitalization, um, because you do like to kind of see it on page and exactly it, it's kind of when studying journalism, it's very important as well. But um, yeah, no, I'm, the majority of my sources were digitized that I could see in either Dublin or kind of um, Match United or in Boston. Lovely. Uh, well, Gormila, Fiona, Vishanan Simul, um, and uh, I look forward to reading that myself. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Um, we'll move on now to Tim McMahon. Um, and I introduced him at the start, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to ask him to rewind to the start to hear his bio, and then they can fast forward again to where we are here uh, to hear Tim. So I mentioned that Tim um, has done a lot of work into the early years of Conor Nagelia. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, Tim, you've often explained that language movements were part of a transnational phenomenon um, or the language movement in Ireland, in spite of its nativist elements. What do you mean by this exactly? Thanks, Kieran. Um, 
So, I, I mean, I, I mean this in, in two senses and, uh, you know, building off of uh, uh, Fiona and Una, I think this, uh, the first sense uh, will make, uh, 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 will be made clearer. Uh, in the first case, I'd say that the language movement simply could not have happened uh, with Conrad Aguilia, um without the support and inspiration from diaspora communities. Um, as you know, as they have been saying, uh, and I, I, I'm going to give a, a shout out. I had I had the chance to read Fiona's dissertation, so uh, uh, it it will fundamentally, I think, change the way that we have thought about some of these things, and really builds on Una's pathbreaking work uh, about uh, the Philo-Celtic societies in particular. But um, uh, what what I, I want to point out is that the American diaspora was integral to both the ideology that the Gaelic League would ultimately espouse uh, and also inspiration in terms of things like putting putting columns in papers. Um, uh, early on, I started to trace some of this through uh, the papers of John Glenn in Tum, uh, for instance, who edited uh, the only regular weekly column in Irish uh, in a newspaper uh, uh, in Ireland in the 1870s and 1880s. Uh, uh, he collected letters as well as columns from Irish American newspapers uh, that uh, he, he preserved in these, these beautiful uh, uh, notebooks um, <clears throat> that are in the National Library. Uh, and uh, you can actually see him writing back and forth to some of the editors of these papers, including in areas uh, to build off of Breen's question earlier that we don't often think of. Uh, I'm thinking of people like Father James Keegan in uh, St. Louis, St. Louis, Missouri, which had a sizable Irish population and served as a jumping off point for migrants who might be making a second migration, like they'd come to Philadelphia, then on to St. Louis and perhaps points further west. Uh, Keegan was uh, uh, writing in Irish uh, and also uh, writing histories in the English language of, of Ireland. Um, but he kept up with what was happening in Ireland and, and people like Glenn were keeping up with, with folks like him. Uh, in that way, uh, when the next generation, if you will, the people like Douglas Hyde or Owen McNeil are coming along, they, they are informed about what's happening in Irish America. Uh, and these ideas help to, I, I think, really inspire them. And then obviously later through traveling to America, collecting money, uh, meeting with Irish Americans, this too uh, would play a role. Uh, Hyde had visited some of these uh, locales uh, after teaching in Canada for a year uh, prior to founding uh, uh, the, the Gaelic League. So uh, much of this is, is influencing things. So that's point one, the connections with the diaspora. But the second point uh, about transnationalism is that uh, language and cultural movements were happening all across Europe uh, in the uh, 1800s and early 1900s, uh, just as, as Ireland was part of a multinational empire that is the United Kingdom. Uh, there were plenty of other uh, uh, small nationalities as uh, the Czech historian Miroslav Froch calls them, uh, who were parts of multinational, multi-ethnic empires. Uh, many of them had uh, language movements of their own. Uh, one thinks of the Czechs, one thinks of South Slavs, uh, one thinks of, of uh, Belgium, which was a bilingual country. Uh, and their movements inspired members of the Gaelic League to uh, 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 emphasize bilingualism as part of their program in the 1890s and early 1900s. Um, and you even see uh, people like the journalist uh, uh, Liam Ryan, William P. Ryan, uh, uh, writing a, a pamphlet for the Gaelic League about other language movements and the kinds of inspirations those had uh, in their home countries, uh, saying that, that, you know, Ireland was now part of this wider movement. Uh, and I think that's a really important inspirational point, uh, as well as one where they're learning sort of from other movements, what they tried to achieve. So, um, um, touches on something that was mentioned earlier on, but to what extent would you say the revival, using um, inverted commas, was a language revival? Um, 
I, I most certainly think it was a language revival, but like Una um, uh, and the Pleasant Hours uh, in the, uh, the Gaelic societies in America, many Gaelic League uh, branches in Ireland found themselves shifting away from language uh, instruction or conversation uh, into whether it was dance and music or uh, history lessons, um, uh, basically, uh, you know, learning the cupola focal and uh, then moving on to other uh, entertainments. Um, you know, the, the, the leadership of the Gaelic League was very much aware of this phenomenon uh, uh, throughout uh, the early decades of the revival. Uh, and they kept coming back to the point that the language was the centerpiece and needed to remain the centerpiece. Um, but the other, the other element that makes this difficult is that you also had people who would join a branch and they'd be in the branch for several months, maybe a year, and then they'd go on to other pursuits. They might participate in a fesh later, uh, but they weren't actively learning the language. Uh, beyond the cupola focal. Uh, so, you know, you'll see, for instance, uh, the, the most uh, famous publications uh, that the Gaelic League had were O'Grownie's Simple Lessons in Irish. And volume one of the Simple Lessons sold hundreds of thousands of copy, uh, copies, whereas volume five sold tens of thousands, right? Uh, you, you, you have very few people who are progressing uh, even to volume five of the Simple Lessons Whereas they're they're all becoming familiar with, you know, how to you know greet each other and learn how, whether they're hungry or tired, uh, whether the sheep is sick, uh, that sort of thing. Um, uh, you know the kinds of simple phrases that one finds even in conversational books today. Uh, I, I I don't want to dismiss the the language element though because I don't believe we would have Irish language television, Irish language radio. Irish language literature to the same extent we do in Ireland today, were it not for the efforts of the Gaelic revival. Uh, preserving the language as a language of everyday use, I think uh, was something that, uh, that that shift in mentality was itself a revolutionary act uh, that, that I don't know would have happened had the, the language movement not come into existence. Um. That's very interesting and again opens up a lot of avenues for um, further questions. Uh, just to finish off our own round here, Tim, the main sources you are using for your work up to now and are there any sources that you'd like to access that you haven't been able to access over the years or that, that are unavailable for some reason or another? Sure. Um, so very useful to me, uh, as as uh, both uh, Fiona and and Una have said, newspapers, uh, not just the newspapers of uh, the language movement, uh, like on Clive Salish, Fanny on Lay, um, uh, but also uh, daily newspapers and weekly newspapers from throughout Ireland. Um, I also was able to access a lot of the early records of Conor Naguaga that were put into the National Library. Uh, those were incredibly helpful to me. Um, uh, and there were still some records that were uh, at uh, the Gaelic League's headquarters that I also was able to look at early uh, minute books and, and early membership lists, which I subsequently compared to the 1901 and 1911 census and also to local directories to try and trace who the people were who actually joined uh, the Gaelic League in those early days. Um, but lacking were a lot of minute books. So I relied on newspaper reports of, of minutes. Uh, uh, I was able to get a hold of a couple of minute books, uh, which were very useful to look and drill down to individual branches and their activities. Uh, a number of branches maintained their minute books. And this was, this was a limit on me as an American researcher with limited time and budget. Uh, coming to Ireland, uh, had I gone to some cities like Limerick, for example, I think the Limerick Gaelic League still has their original minute books from the early days. Uh, uh, and I know that uh, the Conra has, has uh, uh, turned over much of its archive to uh, University of Galway. Uh, 
uh, which has uh, uh, done a phenomenal job of, of going through the archive up into the 20th century with lots of ephemera as well. Man, I'd love to get a hold of that material uh, for a further study down the line. Uh, but minute books would be the, 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 the element that I'd, I'd most be interested in. Uh, and now that the census is fully digitized, I started this project before the digitization. So I was looking at old minute books. Uh, now I can, if I have those lists of members, I can actually do the tracing from home here in Wisconsin. So uh, uh, the prospects of further research are really exciting. Fantastic. Gormila Mahatim, I pass things back to Bria now, who will interview Jay Hollis. Okay, so uh, Hollis is up next, and uh, Hollis is a doctoral student up at DeKalb. So, Hollis, what are you working on? What excites you these days? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, um, so, currently, my uh, it's an article in progress um, that focuses on landscapes that are imagined in the Irish American press. Um, it's really starting from the assumption that they're, yes, of course, physical entities, but that they are also um, these kind of reimagined things. I, I refer to them as environmental imaginaries. Um, and that the, the, this diasporic context um, kind of distinctly changes uh, how these Irish national settings are actually used and, and kind of um, seen by the people that are consuming these newspapers. Uh, so between 1893 and 1910, activists like Stephen McKenna, uh, Geraldine Haverty, Patrick Ford, John DeVoy, um, they were all you know, kind of working through these distinct press outlets to conjure um, Ireland's natural settings for Irish American audiences that most of them never saw these, these natural settings, these, these landscapes, these environments. Um, and so many of those efforts, as far as my researchers have been able to identify, they're, they're filtered through a common kind of homeland motif um, that was used to construct Irish environments as an ideal place from which Irish Americans hailed. Uh, I see this shared but contested landscape as a, as a good place to reassess some common assumptions about uh, late 19th century relationships between organizations like the Gaelic League, um, the United Irish League in America, and Clan na Gael, um, especially given that my dissertation research mainly focuses on the reunification of Clan na Gael as a lens to kind of see and reassess political culture in Irish America. Um, so I do that by interrogating this kind of core strategy um, that they all use to engage target, target audiences. And uh, in this devel developing article, my main kind of argument is that uh, media using the homeland motif uh, reveals a shared landscape of belief upon which all these groups operated despite adherences to seemingly very different um, versions of nationalism, nationalism so you know, cultural, um, advanced um, and of course constitutional nationalisms um, and I've been able to kind of isolate three specific environmental imaginaries um, but the one this article that in particular really plays with is the revivalist imaginary uh, and, I, and I kind of stumbled on it um, in uh, a press outlet that uh, Fiona mentioned in her in her bit um, on, on Gail and uh, Stephen McKenna uh, starts with this really beautiful description of the landscape that's almost fantastical and it has no mooring to physical location. It's just not uh, moored to any real place in Ireland, but he describes it as um, a desert, which, you know, as we, as we all know, like deserts aren't exactly common uh, on the Green Island, but um, at the same time, the, the Gaelic revival comes into his description as a, a rushing brook flowing through the landscape. Um, and as he kind of takes the reader through the landscape, you start to see that this landscape is, is truly becoming alive and there are people witnessing the brook and it's inspiring them to want to, to learn this language um, and, to, and to kind of be part of this cultural revival. Uh, so I kind of start from that assumption um, as I'm doing this research in this in environmental history seminar with um, one of Sean Farrell's colleagues, uh, Dr. Bruno um, at NIU. Uh, I kind of start from this assumption, well, like, apparently like these landscapes aren't um, being described in, in their totality, in their kind of geographic, uh, physical sense, they're being reimagined in this in these diasporic press outlets. And, and why? What, what's the what's the point of that? Um, what's what's so special about the landscape when so many of these people would never see them before they died? Um, so I kind of envision these environmental imaginaries as co as a collective nation forming metaphor um, through which Irish Americans are able to kind of uh, again collectively. Uh, imagine the nation, um, especially given that the period of research I'm working on, 1890 to 
you're still a couple of decades before the Easter Rising, uh, the revolution. The nation really hasn't come online yet. It hasn't started to truly like in its in its physical kind of visible sense form. Um, so these people are all part of this process of like actually collectively imagining it. It's it's very, it's a very different take on what what we're, what we're used to hearing. Um, is there any connection to is the, does the Gaeltacht feature in any of this, or is there any specific mention of the Irish language in this Im environmental imaginary? Oh, absolutely. It's 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 really important for for some people. So um, there is a passage in the Irish world where Patrick Ford is exchanging letters with um, Bishop O'Donnell, and they talk specifically about the Gaeltacht as a place where um, this revival will be at its strongest. It's almost like a base, like a a, a bedrock for. For revival to happen because specifically like, they envision it as a place where the people are best suited um, because of this longer tradition of actually speaking Irish on a daily basis like they're well suited to kind of carry this revival out into the world and it's not just into Ireland it is truly into the world um, they they envision if, if you could use McKenna's you know kind of flowing brook metaphor they envision that brook flowing out from the Gaeltacht into Ireland and then into you know uh, uh, Irish North America into Australia all these other places where the language is becoming more and more prevalent uh, because of the revival. Um, so absolutely, and, and um, on another uh, speech uh, given on behalf of the Gaelic League that gets printed in the in the world, um, Patrick O'Byrne um, refers to very specific uh, ge geographies as the guardians of the linguistic heritage uh, that's you know kind of established by these forefather people that that, that spoke the language um, before, of course, it began this decline and. Almost every single one of these locations are, are right in the Gweltucht. Uh So he's there's this kind of sense that it is it is a very important spiritual bedrock for the revival. And this is at a spiritual level rather than cultural tourism. There's no sense of you should go back and visit these places. I think there very much is a sense that people should go back and visit. That that was that was definitely being um, kind of proffered to the to the audience. Uh, but I think there was also realization that. Uh, it just wasn't as easy as, as they wanted it to be. Like it, it wasn't something that could be done on, on a whim. And um, <clears throat> as much as someone like, you know, John Devoy, for example, um, might have, uh, you know, might have very much loved to go see Ireland, a, a lot of the members of Clan Nagel and, and all these other organizations could, just couldn't quite afford it. Um, like in, in this economic sense, they're not exactly working in these kind of high-end jobs. They're, they're dock workers. They're, they're working in coal mines. They're working in the, in, the, in the slums in New York or any of these other places. Um, and, and just scraping by and getting and, and making it happen uh, day by day. Um, so I think there is a there is like a sense of, of being called back um, that just wasn't quite accessible, but nonetheless was something that was very much marketed. OK, OK. And of course, environmental studies and the future of environment are very much on our minds, uh, minds these days. So it's, it's a very different take on what we're used to discussing and used to hearing about. It's a different way of conceptualizing and hearing it. So I look forward to hearing more and reading more about that in the in the coming years and uh, and conferences. Thank you. So, Thank you. Cool. Arash, cool. Arthur, and just to finish off there, one last question for Hollis. Um, the main sources you're using, and are there any sources that are um, difficult for you to access or that you'd like to <clears throat> exploit more or have a chance to exploit more? Oh, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> as, as several of the panelists have already mentioned, like some of these sources, uh, especially in, in context of the Gay League in America, um, they're, 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 the minute books are basically inaccessible to, to a graduate student here in, in America um, uh, without some kind of other funding. But then uh, the sources I use in particular in this project are all digitized newspapers. Um, and they're a great place, like in particular, uh, on Gale is a great place to get uh, the Gaelic League in America's minutes because there are compressed, condensed versions of the conferences that happen, um, the various uh, yearly conferences. Uh, but those aren't even those are those don't even approach the type of detail that a minute book would offer, um, or that any other uh, kind of like internal source, internal organizational, institutional source would offer. Um, so getting greater access to those or, or having them digitized would just be you know a, a massive help. Um, Particularly given like the the funding kind of and kind of like economic limitations on research as a graduate student. Okay, fantastic, Camila Mott, Jay Hollis, um, and I'd like to welcome Nick Wolf uh, to our panel this evening. Um, last but not least, and uh, I'll I just have a few questions for you, Nick, um, before we move into the 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 open round of discussion. 
Um, your book on Irish speaking Ireland has been, I'd say it's fair to say, kind of a hit on the Irish language research scene. Uh, and the title, of course, is, is a title that creates conversation and raises questions. So to what extent would you say it was true that Ireland was an Irish speaking island in the 19th century? Yeah, I think one of the goals that I had with that title selection and with the kind of scope of the book in general was to ask us to consider when somebody says something is either an Irish speaking area or an English speaking area, who the perspective is that we're talking about. And so much of the history of that period had been talked have been written from the perspective of a very national or uh, uh, you know, certainly assessing the language as spoken by elites or preferred by elites. And so I was asking really, can we look at what a local perspective would bring to this? Because for some folks in Ireland in the 19th century, Irish was a language that was everywhere, right? Even in, you get some sources that would say the idea that I was endangered was uh, difficult for them to believe because it was so um, ubiquitous in their everyday life. Now, of course, we know it was endangered. We know that there was uh, an elite that was abandoning it. We know that it was uh, an endangered language. Um, but we want to just assess, right, what all viewpoints on on the realities of how that felt or how that, you know, um, how that played out in, in, in daily language. Uh, incidentally, I remember one review, or maybe it was just a comment in re response to this in the general press, maybe the Irish Times or something where somebody said, oh, even this title uh, sounds like it's really pushing Irish language on us. Like this was meant to be, uh, they felt like this was actually ideological in a, in a, from that commenter's point of view, negative way, as though I was dragging them into the language class even by using that. But I figured maybe that was actually a good sign that it was a, it was a, good, a good choice of title. Um, but yeah, that was the, the real goal was to, to shift that perspective and, and consider many perspectives on that. And um, it should be noticed that the Irish Times has recently appointed a new editor who is an Irish speaker, actually. So it's unlikely such a such a response to be printed again. Yeah. Should you write a, a sequel? Yeah. Uh, what are the most common misconceptions about linguistic behavior in Ireland in the period covered by your book? Um well, I could say one thing is one thing I was trying to really challenge is the notion that. Um, linguistic behavior could be inferred by uh, acquisition of bilingualism, as though that acquisition in and of itself was proof that everyone that acquired English or was uh, using English was doing so for one reason, and that reason was because they, they desired to abandon Irish or they had a, a universally negative views of the language. And what I pointed out was that when we have studied sociolinguistics, when we look at cases of language shift or language endangerment, that there are a variety of reasons that are uh, surfaced in opinions about why they are acquiring a, another language or why they are shifting to bilingualism or even, you know, uh, shifting with uh, and avoiding or um, abandoning their original language, that it doesn't always have to be out of hatred. It's kind of this challenging this notion of self-hatred, I guess, uh, if you can call it that. Uh, around uh, around language, certainly that would be present in, in cases. But there's again multi -vo multiple voices here on on how those attitudes play out. So I think one of it was just that that notion, that misconception that you can always infer uh, language attitudes from language selection, language learning, language shift. Um, the other one was just, uh, probably maybe the other one I might mention is just the mis misconception that um, you could somehow confine Irish to certain spheres uh, without it leaking into many different spheres of life. Uh, even if you were to say, okay, let's look at elite views about what, uh, what uh, spheres or what social situations are deemed correct for Irish to be used and what's not. Um, Irish, uh, could happen in, in, in a variety of contexts, uh, could be spoken in a variety of contexts. Um, that doesn't mean it was the norm or that it was favored or that it, you know, uh, there wasn't barriers to it being used. But like anything in life, uh, attempts by elites to confine things often doesn't work. And that was part of what I was trying to identify were those cases where language could be used in a condition where or a situation where it normally 
you wouldn't expect it to have been used. Um, and part of that, you know, ends up being a challenge to those spheres. The other thing I wanted to make clear was that those spheres weren't in existence in many cases in the 19th century, uh, uh, or if they had been, they were relatively new. So it wasn't as though you have these spheres that are deemed to be English only areas of life or English only situations. And then they're forcing Irish speakers to know English, to participate in them uh, as if they were longstanding. What I was saying is those spheres are actually being created in the 19th century. And then they are trying to negotiate how you put them into places where Irish speaking is so prevalent that they can't actually be welcomed into those spheres without them, be without that being mediated. So it's 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 and the ones I cite, of course, are um, the Catholic Church, right? Who suddenly wants everybody to come to church and follow the very prescribed uh, behaviors in the church, like going to confession regularly. Uh, listening to sermons, uh, and those things were uh, being imposed really by the church in a new way because they have the, the person power to do that. And so uh, they have to negotiate uh, language in those because they're, they're, they're newly being uh, expanded into, the, into more uh, aspects of life. Um, I cite other ones that are new to the 19th century. One is uh, very uh, widespread, well, not widespread, <laughs> super widespread, but more widespread than it had been voting participation. You know, that's just not something that exists prior to the reforms of the 19th century. And so when you implement these new spheres, you have to, they suddenly have to contend with the language question. So some of those mis misconceptions I would say were high on my list to address. Um, and then finally, what were the main sources that you used in your research? Um, were there any sources that you weren't able to access, would like to have accessed? Uh, yeah would like to see made more accessible in the future? Yeah, well, you end up for this type of work, you have to look everywhere because it's not uh, evident where you're gonna find these traces. It's very much a, a hidden history in the sense that, um, that you don't get overt commentary on it. It's often indirect as most social and cultural history taking the non-elites as its topic will be. Um, so for me, you know, I had to look into church records, not knowing if I'd find anything. I had to look into administrative records and official government sources, but I also had to look into folklore, uh, memoirs, diaries, kind of what you would call um, uh, vernacular uh, social history sources like diaries or um, former kept um, uh, uh, daily planner kind of things, you know, anything I could get my, my hands on that I thought might uh, shed light on this. Um, sources that I really would have loved to look more at and, and, and didn't have the time to uh, would be things like the, um, you know, the, the chief secretary's papers, some of the um, stuff that's under cataloged still at the National Archives. It's getting better uh, even since I was trying to work on this in the earlier part of the 2000s. But, um, uh, you know, those administrative papers actually along with the educational records at the National Archive, which if you read through those, I mean, it's just like vignettes of local life uh, in those that are hinted at. You're, you're reading them against the grain of, of them being um, in some sets, very legalistic documents or, or intended to control local populations. But um, if you read those against the grain, you get all those great vignettes and it's just, they're not cataloged for that purpose. So you have to skim endless boxes of them. Um, and, and I just, I could not um, find the time to do all that, right? I had to concentrate on what I knew would uh, give us the information we needed. So there'll be more information in those. I, my hope though, is that uh, what you would find there would be broadly the same of, what is of the, um, in terms of conclusions as what we know from the sources that we have been able to look at, um, that there wouldn't be anything startlingly different. It would either support uh, one uh, aspect or another of what we know from the sources that we have been able to read through. Well, Carmila Mahat Osakchin, Nick, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they will be become more exploitable in the years to come. Yeah. Um, I'm going to hand over to Brian again to to start us off on our our short uh, round of open discussion. So, um, thank you all. So, a question I want to throw out there, and I suppose there isn't a, it's it's an either or question and it won't be an either or answer but the revival 
did it begin in Ireland or did it begin in the US? Is it a question or a poll? I'll go to Tim first. I took my time on muting so I could think. Um, <clears throat> I think the structure of the revival that took off in the 1890s is uh, something that was inspired from the US, but that began in Ireland. It could not have done its work in Ireland without what was already happening in the US. Okay. That, so is, that is splitting the line there, Breen. Yeah. 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 And I might add to that. I think, you know, they needed the figures of Hyde and, you know, perhaps Pierce and McNeil, and perhaps they needed, you know, the Gael took that kind of geographical location as well, where those kind of key Irish, like the native, I suppose, Irish speakers were, where you have somewhere that you can, I suppose, identify with as well. I think kind of moving on from that, yes, like, I don't, like, I think a lot of the think tanks and perhaps a lot of the similarities and the foundations kind of were stirred up in an Irish American context, but I think it needed key leaders, figures, and perhaps location um, to really kind of bring everything together and that you can find in an Irish context. You know, like I, to, to build on, on that, Fiona, I, I think um, one of the figures who's, who's underappreciated outside of like those of us who focus on uh, the Gaelic revival, uh, but, but from a strategy standpoint, building the, the, um, uh, the revival at home, Father Michael O'Hickey, I think, is a, an incredibly important figure, um, in part because uh, in the late 1890s and early 1900s, Hyde was busy with a lot of things and was not doing the day-to-day -day work of building up uh, the Conra, and instead it was O'Hickey. Uh, he managed a lot of the executive committee meetings. It was he and his students who were uh, 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 helping to uh, form branches a lot. Um, uh, and I just think in many ways, uh, he's an underappreciated strategic person in those early days of the revival. I think Keegan as well that you mentioned earlier yeah. in an Irish American context and um, Father James Keegan from St. Louis as well is very much perhaps overlooked and in particular he does have a letter as you mentioned in the NLI in um, John Glynn's notebooks he has a letter to John Glynn in 1890 um, kind of outlining maybe five or six key steps of what the Irish language movement in Ireland needs to do in order to succeed or to progress and actually the five and six steps that he outlines kind of Nguelga later implement um, three years later so kind of those I suppose key figures as well, as you mentioned, have been perhaps overlooked by the more kind of maybe studied hide mm -hmm. here. Smack me out. Um, those steps you're referring to there, were, were they conceived in isolation in the context of the US and recommendations made from afar, or were they based on um, study of other examples of linguistic movements, uh, things that were tried and tested that had worked? Because I think there's often this um the tension between the idealism of the revival and uh, a scientific approach we, we know a lot more about language planning now uh it's just just a, a far bigger body of work on the subject yeah i think it was perhaps his own experience and um, he he did come from ireland and i think it was just himself keeping in contact with the Irish situation, he had he has letters as well to hide. Um, so it was very much kind of, you know, literature. And um, we need to have Irish printed in literature, we need to have books, we need to have kind of societies come together, and um, we need to celebrate the language, we need to put it into the schools. It's kind of those sort of kind of steps that he was outlining that you see later on um in kind of more 20th century. And um, so I think perhaps it was just his own ideas because he does have a lot of letters in particular in the Chicago Citizen and um, kind of outlining those kind of early ideas as well kind of late 1880s before he sent kind of these letters then to Hyde and Glynn in the 1890s. They, they, those correspondence uh, uh, Kuan, um, I mean like uh, Keegan and, and Glenn are, are actually, uh, actually uh, 
mentioning we think this guy Hyde might be somebody that could be important. Uh, they mentioned Father O'Growney as well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so like it, it's it, there is there is a transatlantic awareness of potential leaders, and interestingly enough, they are people who become key. Um, to Nick's point earlier, also about um, you know finding the language in places they, that it wasn't expected. One of the things that I find you know, like to, to, to go with the history of emotion here, one of the things that, that I find fascinating about early Gaelic League sessions is when you read about people like Owen McNeil standing up at the blackboard and, and older people in those meetings getting almost teary-eyed because they never expected to see a man in a suit leading a session like that, Oscoga. You know, I mean, like they, that, that was beyond what they could have imagined, but it, of course it was happening. And so once they once they realized that it was happening, that's when they got excited to join. Um, uh, and and so I, I think this is um, an underappreciated element of also that transition between an island that was Gaelic speaking and one that was consciously Gaelic speaking. Um, and then uh, speaking now in 2022, as the decade of centenaries draws to a close, and there's a lot of talk about the the, the Civil War commemorations at the moment. We're talking so much about what's happening in, in North America, influencing uh, revival movements or the revival movement in Ireland. To what extent do you think um, disruptions in those relationships in the 1920s um, and onwards influenced uh, efforts under an independent Irish state to revive um, the Irish language or to, to um, rejuvenate Irish culture? Or do you think um, it made any difference at all? I don't know if there's anybody in particular would like to take that one. That, that, that's a hard one because um, I suppose most of us have focused on a period previous to the 1920s. And in some ways, the 1920s is regarded as a sort of a period of silence um, in, in many ways um, because of what happens, I suppose, in the Civil War. And so many people are silent who leave Ireland for, because of the civil war, because they've been on the wrong side, you know. Um, and then you have, I suppose, the 1930s and that contraction. Um, but in, th there's a quote from Canon Haney where he says, you know, that the Irish, uh, that the Irish Americans are looking at Ireland and that they, they don't see all those busy little men look, going about their lives, which is what's happening on the ground. They look back and they see Kathleen Lee Houlihan. And so that this romantic sort of notion that fits very much with maybe what Hollis is talking about in that imagined landscape, that sense of what Ireland is. And in some ways the job is done, you know? I mean, you have the free state. John Devoy heads to Ireland in 1924. He meets W.T. Cosgrove. And, you know, this is the best we can get essentially is what he's saying as this old man um, showing up to give his blessing uh, to this new free state, no matter what's happening. So that link is all, that circle is almost, you know, complete. Um, aside from the horrible scenario of partition, which is sort of put sideways, you know, in, in many ways, which leads to that idea of silence. So to me, and, and remember, I'm looking at it from an earlier period again, that you're looking back and you're saying that in some ways that job is is done, that that sense is there. And and to link up with what 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 um, Nick talked about in the term of bilingualism, I think that's a real issue even for us now. I mean, that came very much to the fore, even when Eamon O'Keefe uh, turned around and said, you know, in the Great that we must have these names just in Irish. And the Dingle one, I think, really threw that up, whether it's going to be Dingle or the Hangany Coot. And, and, and that sense of bilingualism, are we a bilingual state? Um, because how are Irish people looking at themselves as bilingualists? Or are they a state which gives the nod to the Coupla Fockel and really gets on with its pleasant hour of, you know, lots of English stuff that's going on? Um, and, and in a way, I'm not sure how much impact um, Irish Americans have on that because I don't think it's the focus 
of what they're talking about anymore. Um, I'm not even sure it was the focus of what they were talking about, except in a nationalistic sense from about 1910 on, I would suggest. Um, but that, again, that's a very personal view. I don't know enough about the 20s and 30s and what's happening um, then. My sense, Kuan, would be from looking at the history of the Irish language in the universities, is that the creation of the, the foundation of the free state is a disaster for the Irish language in the US, because the presumption now is that independence has been achieved, there is autonomy, the language, the culture will be saved in Ireland. There is no longer the same impetus or need for cultural linguistic action in the US. And the new the, the, the wave of immigrants that come over post-Civil War are disillusioned and to a large part they see Irish as part of the official free state culture, which they just oppose. Either they, they ignore it or they're actively opposed mm -hmm. to it. But the, uh, the creation of the free state and the Civil War is certainly a turning point in the history of the language of the Kunra of some fishermen still continue, but they become much more dancing and hurling and football events than linguistic events. Well, in, to add to that a little bit, um, there's a sense in Irish America, at least in like through the 1910s, that like knowing the language and, and even if not fluently, but speaking it and being able to kind of converse in it a little bit, that it's politically significant and that it's like a part of this identity that's being kind of formed. Um, and that's a that's a powerful motivator to get people to go to, to, to classes, to get them to go to these events and to get them out out the door and into a broader community of Irish speaking people. But as as these kind of bonds start to, to shatter once again in this, you know, uh, 1916 up into the, 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 free, the war of the free state uh, up in that period, like these some of these some of these bonds start to, to, to shatter a little bit, at least in Irish America, where you have someone like John Devoy, as Una mentioned, you know, kind of this mission mission complete sense and really demonstrating that to his followers. And then, you know, Joe McGarity, who's another really powerful member of the Clan Gale, he takes essentially this other wing and decides to keep fighting the fight. Um, but then again, it's not this unified body anymore. It's not this thing that's all working towards this singular goal. Um, and that that hurts. That, 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 that doesn't help. Um, again, that doesn't help the cultural language arrival in Irish America. Could I ask a question, Kuan, if you don't mind? I, I'd like to start with Hollis and Fiona, just because they're the two younger scholars on, on the panel. What is the greatest need? What is the project? What is the book you wished was available when you were starting your research? Good question. Uh, um, I think I spent a lot of time at the start in particular trying to find the sources where were they located what was digitized um like for example does michael logan have you know memoirs like or am i just going down a rabbit hole for no reason does the gaelic league have minutes where can i find them in american you know that sort of thing um i think and i there is a project i do know that um Dara in particular in UCD is kind of with um kind of having these kind of I suppose um spotlights on different archives. Dara Gannon is doing spotlights on different archives and having blog posts based on that. So that is a step in the right direction. But in terms of I suppose Irish America, um it was just a little difficult to find. You're kind of going around in circles sometimes and exactly like what is online, what's available. Do I definitely need to go to Philadelphia or can I find everything perhaps in the New York public library? Um so it's just somewhere perhaps, you know, you can go at the start where all the information is not necessarily in a book, but you know, perhaps some sort of database. Um or even index. I know Matt Knight did an index on um, the different poems, I think, in um, the Irish American in particular. I have a certain index of all the Irish language kind of material in the, in the newspapers um, I studied. So perhaps making more material such as that available. And um, so you're not going to all the indexes of all the different 20 books that are written on Irish America to find exactly where they're, where they're located.
Okay, Hollis? You have very, very similar impression. Um, would, would have loved to have a sense, a, a, an easier, kind of more accessible sense of what's available and where. Um, and, and, and just to see too, you know, some of these newspapers, some of these, um, these source bases, like to see them more easily, easy, easily digitized and accessible. Um, that would be wonderful. Uh, there's also, for, just for my project, um, I would have loved to, <clears throat> if you asked what book I would want to have seen written in the first place, um, just a, a, a just a general history of the Gaelic League in America, just a, a, which um, would be would be a challenging project in and of itself, just because of some of the the issues we've talked about here already. But um, it would have been really helpful to have that kind of basic guiding, you know, kind of light in the archives uh, to kind of contextualize some of the things I was seeing and and to have a greater understanding of like, well, so why, for example, um, is the Gaelic League in America and it's in one of its conference meetings? Why are they uh, coming to blows over um, the the, the Agrani funeral, like why is that such a such a you know such an important moment that that all these people who came um, to be part of this this really wonderful moment of like you know um, organizing over the language and trying to have it uh, spoken more uh, commonly, like why are they now fighting over this over this seemingly like at the time seemingly like insignificant funeral, and of course you know doing the research you find out well okay it's much more significant than just um, it's not just a funeral. Um, but uh, not having that kind of uh, the kind of like secondary framework to work from uh, that, that would have been a lot, that would have accelerated things a lot, made it a lot more uh, easy to do. The, the work. Okay. Slightly different question for Una, Nick, and Tim. Um, you have a million dollars from the Irish Research Council to work on Irish language, Conor Gaelga in America. What's your project? Well, I'm going over to Tim first because, um, you know, he, I figured that he's the repository of so much about the Gaelic League that I figure a visit over to Milwaukee would be a good start. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. Um, and then, of course, um, I, I, it, 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 in terms of having all that money, I mean, there are repositories in the United States of things like, for example, at NYU, and Nick will know this well, of local societies and local um, local groups uh, in the United States of county societies and all of those kinds of things. And they have been painstakingly put together um, over time and collected. And there are people, for example, who don't necessarily want to give their records over, who don't necessarily want to give their stuff over. So, um, I mean, if if I had the chance and if it were me, um, I suppose I would find a central location. I suppose I'll have to throw in Notre Dame here, Brian, um, and um, try and and try and actually have a central repository where people could come um, uh, have their the, themselves recorded in terms of an oral history of what they have, where they got it, what it means to them, and then any records that they would have that they would put together. It sounds kind of like a, a kind of a dumb project in a way, but I think it is the collecting of the material that is the key thing. Um, and that is something that I had really hoped would be there um, or that I would find or somebody would come up with it. I'm still dreaming of it at different times that somebody will actually say, hey, listen, look what I found. Um, and, and the things are so scattered all the time. And I know the digitization is huge and I know it is really, really important, particularly for those of us who work on either side of the Atlantic. It's great for me um, to be able to get stuff from the States. It's great for people from the States to get stuff in Ireland. But sometimes there's nothing better than going to an archive and actually seeing the original, the manuscript, the minute book, the newspaper and turning it over and looking at the pages and finding really dumb things like here's, you know, a grape scissors that was given for uh, a wedding present in 1902. And I'm thinking to myself, what in God's name is a grape scissors, you know? So those kinds of tiny things that you never expected to find um, could be found in a repository. So if I had the money, I would be very old fashioned and that's what I would do. Um, so yeah, watch out there, NYU, Notre Dame and Milwaukee. I'm on my way uh, with my billions of dollars. <laughs> Thanks, Luna. Uh, I, I would say the same uh, about both 
spending the money to create these repositories in the first place, but also uh, spending the money to give folks the time to be able to look through them because it is a time consuming process. And this is what often is overlooked about what uh, archively based research or archively based scholarship entails. It's a lot of time uh, of turning up nothing uh, to find that one thing that you need. And, and it's always this case where, where things are not cataloged according to a subject that you're pursuing and there's no other way to do it. So, yeah. so let me build on that, Nick, because I think there's, there's a couple of things that I would say. First is that um, uh, what you're talking about is um, pure research, right? And we tend to think of this in the sciences and we tend to accept that sometimes scientists are gonna come up with inconclusive results, but the methods they develop and the, uh, uh, the lessons they learn from uh, those inconclusive results lead to the next experiment. Uh, uh, we as researchers are doing the same thing. It's just that we're not in a laboratory, we're in an archive uh, and, uh, or we're in conversation with people and that costs money. And it deserves the money to be spent uh, properly. Um, we are, you know, trained professional researchers, and in order to do our job, we have to have access to that material. Libraries are under-resourced on university campuses all over the world. Uh, archives are under-resourced uh, all across the world. And so, you know, I, I I would champion the spending of money on archives and access to them. The second thing I would say, and this uh, builds directly off of um, uh, conversations I was involved with when I was uh, ACES president, Culture Ireland um, began holding meetings with representatives of cultural uh, organizations from across the United States uh, to try and build up networks of people who um, uh, are engaged in uh, activities, whether it's holding festivals or it's uh, uh, they, they have a theater, they have uh, a, a library in their community. I think the more that those people can be networked and not just in the big cities, not just in New York, not just in Boston or Chicago or San Francisco, but places, I mean, St. Louis is a sizable city, but it's not often spoken of. Milwaukee is a big city, but it's not often spoken of. Um, uh, because we're understandably overshadowed by Chicago, which is 90 miles away. Um, and yet, like a colleague of mine here who works in a library uh, uh, at my university in Marquette um, has done research because he's excited about the language. He's done research into Irish societies, language societies across the United States in the 20th century. But this is, this is avocation for him he does it in his spare time. Wouldn't it be great to have somebody who was paid to do that full time um, uh, and who could build up the contacts with people who could help us reach to, to Irish speakers in northern Michigan or uh, people in Butte, Montana or people in Texas um, uh, who aren't on the usual visits uh, that, uh, uh, you know, we, we make as researchers, but that we could. Um, I mean, I think of the, the incredible collection at the University of Kansas, uh, P.S. O'Haggerty's papers. I mean, my gosh, uh, you know, there's so much we can learn uh, that we just don't even think about uh, archives existing in, in specific spots. So um, uh, yes, come fund us, <laughs> let us do more. I think that's a great place, a uh, call to action. <laughs> For us to end uh, this evening's discussion, and for my part, I guess our son, Conor Nagrelia, I'd like to thank um, everybody who took part in this evening's discussion. I think it was very interesting, a whirlwind tour through some of the research going on at the moment, and a few pointers towards where um, we need to, uh, uh, as Conor Nagrelia, as an advocacy organisation, look towards getting things opened up or trying to find uh, funding for things in the future. And of course, it was wonderful to cooperate with Brian and with Notre Dame again. So for my part, Gormila Mila Mahabit. Gormahad Gurfad, Gormahad Huan, Gormahad and Conra, August Bokor Ahantis, of course, the Huan, Augustan Conra, Asabal Dentaka, the Demlena and those Con Over, a Halahar Dar Lahedi. So, uh, of Valam Wakas of Wallace and Dr. Heather Stanfield, the Imun Technoliata. Inov, uh, Heather, thank you very, very much. Uh, Una, uh, Hollis, 
Fiona, Tim, Nick, uh, thank you all very, very much. And uh, we wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving. Shanae, Gramaga Bacharda. Gramaga. Gramaga.